I'm very grateful to Barry and Brenda for their leadership this morning. I was taught the language of hymns for the first 23 years of my life. So much so, uh, I became so fluent that uh, I can close my eyes and pretty much remember the verses in the chorus of the hymns we sang this morning and countless others besides. But another, another result of that is it stirs memories, nostalgia, but also warm, warm recollections of what it felt like to be a child and a youth growing up in a church that loved God with all their heart, loved each other, and just wanted to see God's kingdom extend in this green and pleasant land that we live in. Uh, so thank you for your leadership. When I spoke to you last, it was uh, December, Christmas loomed before us. I spoke about ornaments. Do you remember that? Uh, and I promised that we would start the new year uh, picking up where I left off because I had more to speak about. But now, of course, uh, some of you as early as Boxing Day, some of you are, are maybe planning to do it this weekend, but eventually we all put our ornaments away off the Christmas tree, don't we? Well, maybe you don't. I do. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bittersweet time for me, more bitter than sweet. I love Christmas. I love decorating for Christmas. When I take down the tree, the room seems a little darker, a little emptier than it had for a month, because <laughs> I get going as quick as we can. And now all of a sudden, the ornaments are all t tucked away. Uh, but that doesn't have to be the case as far as our lives are concerned. Uh, we have lawn ornaments, garden ornaments. All year long, we continue to use this phrase, ornaments. Let me, let me remind you what Merriam-Webster says an ornament is. It's something that lends grace, beauty, or festivity. Is that you? Do you lend grace, beauty, festivity? Would people in the neighborhood say, boy, we just love it when you show up to events because it's, it, the, when you leave, it's just better than when you arrived. When you leave, people feel better about the community than when you showed up. Or, or how about this definition, a manner or quality that adorns. Do you adorn your family? Do you adorn your church family? Uh, are, when you show up, whenever your church meets, typically on a Sunday morning for many of our churches, uh, like, when you walk in, are they, are they pleased to see you, to say, you know what, I'm so glad I get to worship with you today. You just adorn this family. But the one that really sits close to me is this definition, one whose virtues or graces add luster to a place or society. Your virtue and graces add luster to a place or a society. In December, I asked, you know, what are we adorned with? Do our virtues and graces add luster to our communities and to our families? God's going to continue to work in our lives this semester to carefully craft, if I can say it, ornaments in us. And they will often be displayed in the, in the context of crisis. What might some of those ornaments be? Well, in December, I talked about encouraging speech from Proverbs 12, 25. I talked about life-giving speech, Proverbs 13, 14. Intentional speech, Proverbs 15, 1 and 2. I'm going to keep that theme rolling. And we're at both in Proverbs and in speech. And uh, I'm going to do, give a disproportionate amount of time to this first set of verses in Proverbs chapter 10, verses 31 and 32. This is what the writer says. The mouth of the righteous produces wisdom, but a perverse tongue will be cut out. The lips of the righteous know what's appropriate, but the mouth of the wicked only what is perverse. Can I just call this ornament wise speech? As God's people, I pray that we have wise speech adorning our lives. The Amplified Bible translates uh, this, uh, the first section of this verse this way, uh, that for the, the mouth of the righteous flows with skillful and godly wisdom. Flows with skillful and godly wisdom. Eugene Peterson interprets the verse in the, in the uh, message as saying that we have a clear fountain of wisdom gushing from our mouths. Well, I would have to say that legitimate wisdom is connected with a reverent humility before God. Amongst a host of verses, I could say Proverbs 1, 7, Proverbs 10, 27, uh, the fear of the Lord is the, is the root bed, it's the seed bed of wisdom. What we believe, how we reverence God, 
influences how we speak and act in, this, in our everyday life. You know, I drive out from South Calgary most days, and uh, I, it takes me through, it doesn't matter which route I take, it takes me still, maybe not much longer, but still through fields that have been harvested or are about to sprout forth and spring new growth or, or, or give evidence of hard, long days of summer as people are toiling in the fields to break, make sure they bring in maximum harvest. But right now, everything's quiet, isn't it? There's evidence that every, the fields have been mowed, the snow is laying over them. But soon there's going to be tilling and tending. And then there will be those long summer days equaled by the long work that goes on in those fields. And after the care and the work of summer, finally the harvest will come again. And before the fields rest again in another winter, we will get to watch what kind of field was tended or nurtured based on the harvest that's brought in. The harvest will reveal whether the field was good and productive or well tended or whether it was neglected and parched. I would suggest to you that we, we lead, teach, preach, minister out of the harvest of our hearts. What are we nurturing there this semester? Wisdom's not accidental. We seem to live in a day, especially with social media, where we all want to be the people who drop the, the wisdom bomb. As if somehow, because I'm me, you're just going to stand in awe of every pearl that drops from my lips. It's not, it doesn't work that way. Wisdom comes from the deep well of the reverence that we have for God and time spent in his word. And out of that, we, put, we drop down the bucket and in God's grace, we draw up, I pray to God, wisdom. But it's not accidental. Matter of fact, I might argue it's hard work. It's relentless work. It's, it's the kind of work that is actually open to correction. It's, it's the kind of work that's open to rebuke. It's the kind of work that's, that's open to exhortation, speaking into your life, saying, you know what? You're not going to get the kind of harvest you want unless you get rid of some of this stuff or unless you add some of this stuff in your life. It's hard work. I think sometimes we come to seminary or, or Bible college and think just because I'm a student, I'm going to end up being wise. History tells me that's not true. <laughs> it's not true for your professors. It's just not true for the students. The only, the only assurance you have that you're growing in wisdom is your time spent with the Lord and your time embedded in his word. That's where, the, that's where the tilling, that's where the harvest is nurtured in your heart. Wisdom's the harvest of our reverent humility before God. And, and I'll just say, CBT classrooms are the proving ground for that. Again, I can remember humble students in class, and they, they just kind of gently speak into a conversation that's happening and almost a hush falls over the classroom. It's like we're hearing something from the Lord here. We're hearing something that this student has just gleaned from God's word. But I've also been in classrooms where a student who, who's anxious from their perspective or their specific position, that they're anxious to dominate the class and you realize this is not wisdom speaking. It's, 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 just, it's just human arrogance. How do I know the difference? Is it for the glory of God, flowing from worship of God? Is it for the good of his people, or is it just simply for me? You know, the mouth of, of the righteous produces wisdom. Do you even want to be that kind of person? Does it even matter to you? I hope it does. I mean, it's one of the values of being in a community like this. And then verse 32 uh, the lips of the righteous know what's appropriate. The Amplified Bible interprets it, uh, uh, translates it, uh, the, the, the lips of the righteous know or speak what is acceptable. New Living Translation uh, translates it, the lips of the godly speak helpful words. Eugene Peterson interpreted the verse in the message as the, uh, the, the lips of the righteous, uh, it's, it's a speech of a good person that clears the air. So I'd ask, what's the intention of our speech? 
If you'd have asked me 27, 28 years ago as I was starting in ministry here in Calgary, Rob, do you think most people think about the consequences for what they say and what they do? I think I would have said flippantly, yes, of course. Almost 30 years later, I'd tell you, I think we almost never think of the consequences for what we say do. We just blurt it out. And it's getting worse with social media. Just last night, I observed it on somebody's Facebook page. Is somebody that they just simply made a post, and all of a sudden, somebody decided it was their God given calling without knowing context, without asking for an understanding as to what this person said. They not only, they not only filled in the gaps, they assumed this. Why would they assume this person was a wingnut? But they did, and they just decided it's time for me to just pounce them. And I think that's not righteous, that's just brash, it's just arrogant. What's the intent of my speech? I think in our classrooms, it's tempting to plow through our course material, whether you're a student or the professor. We're just going to plow through it. We've got, what, 14 weeks and then exams. So we're going to put our head down. We're going to get through the material that we've got to deliver. Uh, it's, It's tempting to plow through our sermon outline, our teaching plans, without pausing to wonder what's the intent of what I'm actually doing here. Because the intention of what we do, whether it's here in the school or in the local church, the intention is not, it cannot ever be merely to transfer knowledge. I just want you to know, in our classrooms, we're not interested in you simply leaving each class knowing more than you knew when you walked in. There is going to be some of that in every class. I mean, we're anxious to learn, but that's not all of it. And it's not merely to deliver content, although every professor feels like it's an uphill climb and we try to hit base camps before we hit the summit at the end of the course. There's content that we surely do want to make sure that you talk with us about. But it's not merely that. It it really has to do with spiritual understanding. It has to do with life transformation. To borrow the catchphrase from Camp Homewood, I want life here to change. Put another way, life changes here. Why speech? Why speech is transformative? Does our speech flow freely with appropriate words and helpful words and acceptable words that glorify God and nurture spiritual vigor? A handful of years before I was born, the Scottish theologian John Bailey passed away. He lived 1886 to 1960, perhaps best known for his passion for prayer, perhaps best known uh, as far as prayer as he had morning and evening devotionals that he wrote that could take you through the entire year or month, sorry, praying morning and evening. Uh, on day 16 of one of his devotional books called A Diary of Private Prayer, He simply wrote, By your grace, O God, I will go nowhere today where you cannot come, nor seek anyone's presence that would rob me of yours. By your grace, uh, uh, I will let no thought enter my heart that might hinder my closeness with you, nor let any word from my mouth that is not meant for your ear. So shall my courage be firm and my heart be at peace. Wise words. What's another ornament? Faithful speech, wise speech, but also faithful speech. Uh, I, I want to go to Proverbs 25 and verse 13. The verse reads this way, to those who send him, a trustworthy messenger is like the coolness of snow on a harvest day. He refreshes the life of his masters. New International Version translates this, uh, like a snow-cooled drink at harvest time is a trustworthy messenger to the one who sends him. He refreshes the spirit of his master. The Amplified Bible pulls this apart in its translation and says, like the cold of snow brought from the mountains in the time of harvest, so is a faithful messenger to those who send him for he refreshes the life of his master. 
Again, Eugene Peterson interprets this verse in the message as reliable friends do what they say they're going to do. Like, sorry, re- reliable friends who do what they say are like cool drinks in sweltering heat. Refreshing. For most given winter days, today is beautiful. I mean, they actually have rain in the forecast. Not for today, but for later this week. Possibly rain. Did you? At least that was yesterday. But we're not done with winter yet. I have, my gut tells me there's minus 15, minus 20, minus 25. I hate to say it, but I think those days are still ahead of us. And I don't know about you. I don't like those days. But in the middle of a hot July day, our house doesn't have air conditioning. This last July and August got pretty, pretty hot. I'm going to be honest with you. There was a time in August, early August, in our house in South Calgary, no air conditioning, all the windows open, but no breeze. I would like to have borrowed from a minus 10 degree day to just let it blow through the house and cool me off, refresh me just a little bit. There's something of that in this verse. You know, uh, he's passed away now, but there was a man in the church where I pastored in South Calgary for years. His name was Al Stewart, World War II vet. He actually remembers in his young years, early 20th, early 20th century, up in Edmonton, that he would go down on the North Saskatchewan River. It was his job in the winter. He would go down on the North Saskatchewan River, and they would cut huge, huge chunks of ice out of the, the river, the surface of the river, and they'd put it on sleds, and they'd take it up to a barn. And, and if you don't know anything about the ice houses in Western Canada, they would cover them with sawdust, and they would just layer them in these barn-like structures, and then they'd just leave them there. And they would not melt entirely so that during the hot, hot days of the summer, they'd go into the ice house, and they would break off pieces of this ice that they had cut out in the wintertime, and that's what they'd bring into their home, into the, into the ice box in their home, or just to have ice as a luxury uh, in their beverages. We don't do that anymore. But it taps into this. On a hot harvest day, how cool and refreshing it is to have ice from the mountains brought down to, to, to just cool or soothe that parched throat. And the writer of Proverbs says that's exactly what faithful words are like. Bringing down snow from the mountain during the heat of harvest is like a faithful servant saying exactly what his master told him to say. David Hubbard, and he, he makes this comment on this verse. He says, to be competent, speech not only has to be winsome and forceful, it has to be reliable. Are we faithful messengers? That means that we arrive where we're supposed to arrive, when we're supposed to arrive, and uh, we say precisely what we're supposed to say, the message that I'm supposed to bring. Do you suppose that God feels pleasure when we messengers deliver his word with reasonable accuracy? There's something that concerns me greatly in the church today. And I would say it concerns me in in the midst of us who say that we're biblically grounded. We believe the Bible is our authority in life and witness. And yet we take no care to interpret the Bible accurately. Just because you read a verse and it sounds neat, so you think you're going to jump off of that verse and make some application to COVID, doesn't mean you're being accurate with the Word of God. Matter of fact, you might be abusing the Word of God. And then I'm not a messenger who's bringing God's message to anxious ears. And I don't think it's refreshing to the master who sent me when I do that. I think we who are training to be teachers, leaders, preachers in local churches and ministries across Canada need to be very concerned that we we speak what God's word says, not what we think it says. Or worse, what we want it to say. Because we can abuse the word of God readily. We know that. Just because you reference a verse in your sermon doesn't mean you've preached a biblical sermon. Are we faithful with our speech? It's why next week's lectureship is going to be so important. 
I, I understand that the title, the title of the lectureship is based on the title of the book, and I hope that you will come and that you will bask in the five one-hour sessions that we have, uh, because it's not, he's not saying that the, that the Old Testament is problematic. What he's saying is, we contemporary Christians seem to have a problem with the Old Testament, but let me tell you why it is not problematic. So that we do handle the Word, the full counsel of God's Word, rightly, accurately, and we don't do abuse to it. Are we faithful in our speech? Faithfulness is always refreshing. Are we faithful in the midst of God's people? And then the last is uh, Proverbs 17. Are we gracious? Gracious speech. Chapter 17, verses 27 and 28 say this. The intelligent person restrains his words, and one who keeps a cool head is a man of understanding. Even a fool is considered wise when he keeps silent, discerning when he seals his lips. Chapter 17, verse 28. Um, a year ago, we buried my father. I've been living kind of in that place for the last two weeks of rushes of memory, rushes of his voice, his laughter, and and some of what I have heard, he was, he was very fond of the Proverbs. And as a youth or a child growing up, he'd just kind of drop one. And if he didn't remember the whole proverb, he'd get it started anyway. He loved this proverb, especially when I was going off about something that I clearly had no clue about. And he'd just say, Rob, or Robert, as I used to be called, Robert. Even a fool, when silent, is considered wise. <laughs> He'd accompany that with a more, a more common English proverb, empty barrels make the most noise. <laughs> He'd also accompany that with saying, <laughs> better to be silent and thought a fool than open your mouth and settle all doubt. <laughs> is my speech gracious? Eugene, again, Eugene Peterson interprets this in the message. He says, the one who knows much says little. An understanding person remains calm. Even dunces who keep quiet are thought to be wise. As long as they keep their mouths shut, they're smart. How do you find a fool in the room? Listen. How do you find a fool in the room? Just listen. They'll tell you who they are pretty quick. And uh, how do you find a fool on television? Listen. Does the same rule apply for wise people? It does. Just listen. Have you ever been in a room with somebody and it seems like everybody's waiting? They want to know. The, the, it, the, uh, the issue's not settled until we hear that person speak. You ever been in a room with that person? Typically, it's not the fool they're waiting for. They've already heard ample from the fool. They're waiting for that silent, wise person who's been mulling it over. They've been thinking about it. And they say, uh, brother, sister, what do you think? And then that person speaks, and it's like it just settles the issue. Thank you. Wisdom has spoken now. Gracious speech. I think how we use our words reveals a lot about our heart. The Bible seems to be concerned with our mouth. The Bible seems to be concerned about our speech. Proverbs 16, 23, the first part of that verse says, A wise heart instructs the mouth. Jesus says, Matthew 12, 34, The mouth speaks from the overflow of the heart. So let me say, gracious speech begins in a pure heart. Accurate words bloom in the soil of an uncluttered heart. So measure your words with care. Gracious speech. I will, I will tell you honestly, as I look back now, I'm 56, so I'm, I'm on the back nine. There's, there's been a lot of life lived. If you've been around me any time at all, you know that some of those chapters in my life were difficult chapters. In high school, I, I was bullied 
pretty severely for a set of years. Can I tell you that the things that hurt the most, though, weren't the ample expressions of physical violence. They're not the things that actually changed me inside. It's what people said. But I also want to tell you, looking back over my life, the things that caused me to flourish inside, they weren't the gifts that people gave me that were physical. They were sweet, and people sacrificed over my lifetime, and they've given me beautiful gifts from time to time. But I'm going to tell you the things that have influenced me the most are the things people said to me. Some of you got to meet my daughter, Rachel. She's 24 years old now, uh, and she was up here over the weekend. It was wonderful to get to show her around, introduce to as many people as I possibly could. And in the process, you know, we were reflecting back on her journey um, with some of our Canadian leaders, and one of them whose name uh, you may be familiar with is Dwight Huffman. Dwight is now retired, but Dwight Huffman was a part of our work in Canada, and most specifically for years, our work here in Alberta. I have a high level of respect for Dwight. I was asking my daughter, I said, do you remember Dwight Huffman? She said, I remember when I was 12 years old, 13. We were at a convention meeting in Saskatoon, and Dwight walked up, and for reasons known to God and Dwight, he walked up to my daughter, he held her shoulders in his hand, and he said, when I see you, the light of the Father is in your eyes. She just said, I, he'll never know, Dad. Gracious speech. We say what the Father wants us to say, when he wants us to say it, to whom he wants us to say it, and, and our words are, are chosen with care. We are were, we were intentional with what we say. We know this. And guys, listen, we have 14 short weeks together. I know there's more weeks than that, but as far as instruction, classwork, I mean, we all start wrapping it up after about 14 weeks, including reading week, or plus reading week. So, so we really have very little time. Before we know it, we'll be getting ready for grad. You don't think so, but we will, we will. And we'll be ordering robes for professors and students alike, and we'll be enjoying the first signs that summer's coming as green pops up through the grass. We've got just a handful of short weeks together. We can't afford to be flippant or reckless with our words. Let's choose to be people who add luster and grace to this community. That, that my words are wise, and, and I'm, not, I'm not saying you or I are wise. I'm saying let our words be wise, and the only way I know to do that is by spending time with God and in his word and spending time with his people as they kind of terraform my life, speaking into my life. Let's, let's have wise words add luster to the community where we're studying. Let, let's allow faithful words that, re, that accurately represent what the Father's actually said in his word. And, and I want to be gracious with my speech. I think by May, that could be, that could be the tending and the tilling and the work that by May gives a harvest that you and I are going to like very much. This semester, perhaps ask yourself, what ornaments adorn my life? And God, would you hang a few more off of me for the good of your people and the glory of yourself? We pray. Let's pray. Father, here we sit at the front end of a full semester. You already know what you intend to accomplish in our school. You already know what you intend to accomplish in our lives. Therefore, you have gathered this very specific community together. You've added new students. You've brought back existing students. You've brought faculty into the room. And we're all here as a community 
by your design. And at least part of what you'll do has to do with adding into us this wise, faithful, gracious speech that will adorn any community where you assign us a ministry position, that we would add luster and grace there, and that they would be healthier and more God-oriented simply because your child has been obedient. We pray this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.